Welcome. It's the private life of Peg Lynch. I'm James Lalix. And I'm Astrid King, and I'm Peg Lynch's daughter. Oh, I could swear you were actually Peg Lynch or something. Oh, thank you very much. I do my best. So Astrid will, as in previous episodes, be bringing her mother to life with her own inimitable way. And you, by now, have got a pretty good sense of who Peg was. Precocious child, wonderful, funny, marvelous life that she's told. But we're about to get into the actual radio stuff, the career where she starts to flower. Now, in this episode, Peg's in that period where a lot of people are in radio for the their entire lives and their entire... They never get out of the small town station. But she had gumption and drive, didn't she? Well, she not only had that, but she had uh, she had the sense to do as Dr. Charlie Mayo from the Mayo Clinic years earlier told her when she was working there. He said, doors are going to open for you, Peggotty. You just make sure you walk through them. And of course she did. As you're about to learn, the most critical door for her happened to be the door to a telephone booth in New York City. Ah, that's so mysterious. And that's what you're going to find out now in The Private Life of Peg Lynch. The Private Lives of Ethel and Albert. They live just like the rest of us, only funnier. Yes, it's a brand new show starting April 17th, presented by the Blue Radio Network and starring a likable young couple, Peg Lynch and Richard Widmark. Be sure and listen. You will probably think me crazy, I wrote Mother, and I know disappointing her yet again. But I won't be coming home after all. By the time you get this, I will be in New York. It's the only gamble I've ever taken. I've never, I'm not a gambling person at all. No, not the only one. My landlady in Cumberland was uh, scrubbed her s- stairway in her floors every day and from three until six and then she picked up the racing chart and she made her bets and when I was going out the door one day she said you're putting five dollars on midshipman today I said what I don't gamble she says you are today and when I came home that afternoon she opened her door and handed me the my winnings which was I don't know fifteen twenty dollars and I god I thought here's a new life (laughs) That was easy. Open the door and go out and come back in. You were a winner. And the next morning, I was at her door at 6 in the morning. And she said, no, you're not going to bet anymore. So, But I insisted on one of, later on. I bet twice more, and I lost, and that was the end of my betting career. I don't know if I just had a feeling about New York or what. Well, I knew to make it in radio at all. I had to make it in New York. I suppose that's what drove me. Bob Cotton, he was a radio producer, and he'd said to come see him as soon as I got in and to bring with me some of my Ethel and Albert scripts, and his job would be to try and sell my show. Well, when I got up to his office, Cotton Tunic Productions, I pulled the scripts out of my bag and to my horror saw that I'd grabbed the wrong pile. The ones, the good ones, I'd wanted to bring I'd left back in Cumberland. Can you write a new one? Cotton said. Now? I said. Yeah, he said. He wanted to audition Alberts right away, record the show, and submit it to networks and agencies, you know, like that afternoon. Well, not quite, but it's nothing crazy like that. And so he shooed someone away from their desk and sat me down at the typewriter, and um, I wrote a 15-minute comedy script. I think I still had my coat on. Now, this was January of 1944, and I'll tell you something funny. Well, I don't know if it's funny. Ironic. Annoying. A bit. Six years earlier... When I'd been working up in Albert Lee, Minnesota, George Russell, my then Albert, had, at this same Bob Cotton's request, sent off a transcription disc we had made of an Ethel and Albert sketch, and we never heard back. Well, we just assumed this Cotton thought the show was a dud. You know, well, it turns out Cotton never received it, and he just assumed we weren't interested. I guess nobody thought to phone anybody then. Anyhow, it turns out the disc never even made it to New York. It had burned up along with everything else in a train crash outside of Pittsburgh. Isn't it weird how life works? Makes me kind of burned up to think I might have gotten to New York six years early. I tell you, save myself a lot of headaches. Um, Well, I guess nothing's ever wasted, is it? Anyhow, we needed an actor for Albert fast. And a lot of them were busy doing shows for war bond drives. But Cotton found kind of an old timer called Foster Williams, who was free, I played Ethel, as usual, and over at Muzak Studios, he and I recorded my script on a transcription disc. And the recording in those days meant putting a, a black wax 
uh, thing on the turntable, and then you had the needle, and then this black thread uh, curled up on the floor. Well, there was no stopping and starting. I mean, if you made a mistake or coughed or anything, you had to start over again from the beginning and using a fresh disc. It was really nerve-wracking, I'll tell you, the whole thing. It really was. Well, Bob Cotton submitted it to NBC, and then we heard nothing. Weeks went by. Well, I knew it wasn't another train crash. Bob had delivered it in person, you know. Well, I was really getting frantic, though. I was short of money, no job, chewing my fingernails until they bled, but, of course, telling Mother how great everything was going and, gosh, how swell New York was, etc., etc. Well, while we waited for word from NBC, Bob Cotton suggested me to a Robert Maxwell. Now, he was a well-known, wealthy producer who owned the rights to Lassie and to Superman. And Maxwell was looking for a new writer for a radio series called Claudia. It was a soap thing. Would I try my hand on a half-hour script? They'd pay me $100. Well, I said, yes. And so Maxwell and his wife drove me out to their country house in Patchog or some hog at the very end of Long Island in the middle of a blizzard. God, was it cold? Ice had formed like casting back my early days, which is what I'd gotten out of. And got me a bedroom and I had a typewriter. You know what it's like to do a new machine. You're not used to it at all. And I didn't know the show, didn't know the material. I read it. And I was so cold, I put the, I put the chair and the typewriter on the, this register where you have a, the thing on the floor and the heat comes up. I sat on that while I was doing it. And he used fuck and shit with every word, and I was not used to that. And he made, pa he pretended to make passes. He wasn't making any passes, but he was pretended to, which really just had me up the wall. All the time I'm trying to write. And I didn't manage to turn out a script. I don't know how. And to make a long story short, he turned it in, and nothing came of it. And in, I found out probably five years later, that he said he wrote it, which really annoyed me. Willis Cooper, over at NBC, finally listened to Ethel and Albert and liked it, which was nice, but they didn't like the voices, particularly mine. It's kind of a blow to my ego, but I thought, oh, well, it's a job, you know, and so Bob Cotton re-recorded my script with two other actors who weren't very good, in my opinion, and he resubmitted it. And the NBC voted to put it on, all 13 members of the committee, voted to put it on the air at once. And then they wanted to own it. And I said no. I really didn't know what to do, and I didn't really get into knowing anybody, where I didn't know anybody. But I thought it's all I had, really. So I said no. And that they were willing to let me write it. And I thought, well, I'd still make money from writing it, but still in all I wanted, I thought I should hang on to it. So they turned it down then, because since they couldn't own it. And so, I, in the meantime, I hang on to that thought, because i got to get in an apartment while we're waiting. And I figured, I had paid $40 a month rent, I figured coming to New York, the rent might be a little bit higher than down in Cumberland. I thought maybe they might go up to 60 in New York. Figured I had enough money to keep me for two years. Which I was like green. I was even green then. I had $500 to my name. That's it. I'd been staying out in Dobbs Ferry, which is 22 miles north of the city, at the parents of my friend Phyllis Brown. I mean, they were lovely, but I couldn't stay there forever sponging. And so every day I'd take the train into Grand Central, 97 cents round trip, and I'd look for a place to live. And there was nothing, just nothing. Five flight walk-ups for $80 a month, over the Cobra striptease joint down in the village for $90 a month. I was terribly, terribly discouraged for weeks. And then Phyllis's mother saw an ad in the New York Times. One morning, it was a one bedroom on 20th Street, and I raced in to see it. And, well, I just fell in love with it. It was perfect. But the woman had just 20 minutes earlier promised it to an army man and his wife. I was just sick about it. And then about a week later, the Browns' telephone rang. May I speak to Miss Lynch, please? I said, this is Mrs. Zoni. 
week. I was just wondering if you would be at all interested in the apartment at Gramercy Park. I have decided not to let it to the army man. Oh, God, I can hardly talk. I said, oh, yes. Is it really mine? <laughs> I like Sally Phil letter when she did that. They really like me. And she says, yes, it's really yours. And I went over. It was cold. And I looked out the window. And it was just snowing. Great big snowflakes. And I looked out and I thought, she didn't have my lights turned on yet. Oh, God, I'll never forget that. It was so thrilling. I moved in immediately, March 9th, 1944. I didn't dare tell my mother the price, $110 a month, or that I still had no job, or that I just turned down NBC. She would not have understood. Well, I'm not sure I did either. I was sick with nerves, but I had to have it. I knew that. I would make it work somehow. Number 12 Gramercy Park was and is what's called a good address. The houses, brownstones mostly, they form a square around a private park. You get your own key. And third floor front was light and airy with high ceilings and big 10-foot windows and a working fireplace, furnished and nicely. So all I brought was my suitcase and my L.C. Smith typewriter. Well, I wanted to call everybody right away with my exciting news, but I barely knew anyone in the city. Besides which, I didn't have a telephone. It was wartime and you couldn't get one unless you were a doctor. Now, the very same day, and boy, I tell you, someone up there must be looking after me. I got, well, I, well I'm going to tell you what happened first. I had walked up to the delicatessen on 4th to buy something. I don't know, milk probably. It doesn't matter, but. I gave him a 10 and he said I'd given him a 1 and I didn't get any change. Well, I couldn't, I didn't know what to do. I really felt defeat. I really felt lost. But God damn it, I really felt cheated. I was going to get nowhere with him. I had enough sense with that. So I went home. It was a telegram. And, uh, and it said, well, it, we've, I don't know what, how it was worded, and I never saved it like an idiot. It said that NBC had just lost a show that they thought they ought to hear of mine. And would I please get in touch with him as soon as possible? And it was signed, Philip Carlin, president of the American Broadcasting Company, and gave his phone number. And then I thought, I have no money. I didn't get any change. And went down to the drugstore, and I told him, I said, I'm really, I didn't know him at all. I said, I'm terribly sorry, but I had to make a phone call, and I didn't have any money. And I showed him the telegram, and he laughed. He said, pushed over the phone and said, be my guest. And I was his friend, too, for the next 30 years. And so the next day, I went up to meet Phil Carlin, who ran ABC. Well, that was called the Blue Network then. It didn't become ABC until about a year later. Very briefly, NBC had owned two networks, the Blue and the Red. And the FCC told them that it was a monopoly and they had to sell one. And they sold the Blue to an Ed Noble who owned the Lifesavers Candy Company. And Noble was determined not to have anything what he considered trashy on his network, like soap operas. And Ethel and Albert, which was complete each day, fit the bill. Or more importantly, ABC, the blue, was happy to let me retain ownership of my show. Well, I had enough brains to get a lawyer to look over my contract. But with Bob Cotton, who would be producing and directing, I had a separate agreement. And he was asking for 50% of my show. Now, I may appear gullible and naive, and that people can put anything over on me, and God knows I still can't get financial matters through my head. But I have always counted on my sense of honesty and fair play to see me through, and which it mostly has. And so Bob Cotton kind of came up against a brick wall when he met me. I said I didn't like the idea of sharing profits or of anyone involved in my show making more money than me or even the same amount. Hell, I was doing all the work. I made him lower his salary. Phil Carlin couldn't believe it. But tell you the truth, I couldn't either. Well, I had told Phil and the network right from the start that I did not want to play Ethel, which wasn't true, of course, but... Everybody all my life has said what a peculiar voice I have. And I thought, well, it wasn't sexy and marshmallowy the way the stars were. The soap operas, you know, they do soft, sort of breathy sort of thing. And I didn't want to be rejected. I didn't... I, didn't have enough confidence to be told I couldn't do it, you know? 
And so they said, look, we'll give everyone who auditions numbers, and afterwards we'll pick the two that we think work best together. How's that? You sit with us in the control room and fill in if an actress doesn't show up. I said, fine. Well, we auditioned all week, seeing just about every star in the business. Well, they started in, and uh, the first line of the script, I well remember, they were going to give a dinner that night, small. And uh, as he walks in the door, she said, did you bring home the salted nuts? He said, what salted nuts? She said, well, the first thing I said to you this morning is bring home the salted nuts. Last thing I said to you this morning. And they were reading it this way. Door closes loudly. God, they go for sound effects. Footsteps on the floor, you know, and make all this racket when they answer the phone. Did you bring home the salted nuts? Long pause. What, what salted nuts? It's the last thing I said to you this morning, bring home the salted nuts. I said, could they, could they do it a little faster? Uh, faster? Yeah, a little, pick it up a little. Uh, could you uh, pick it up a little more in there? Sure. Did the same thing all over again. It's exactly the same. I knew the actors were thinking, cripes, this hayseed in there, you know, telling us how to do things. And so when I'd go in and then I'd read it my way and I'd say, would you please do it a little faster? Until I just kept them at it. And I knew they were very irritated with me. But I didn't care. I don't know why I didn't care. I really wasn't at all scared of them anyhow as I ordinarily would have been. But I thought they didn't do it right. And if they didn't do it right, it wouldn't sound right. We'd be making too much of everything. I didn't know Richard Widmark at all. He was available. He was 4F because he had perforated eardrums, but he also had the flu, so he had to wait a week to audition him. I couldn't see that he was any better than anybody else, but the network loved him. And in the end, Dick and I, numbers 11 and 7, were voted the winning combination. Well, I was terribly pleased and surprised that they picked me, but I thought, it's so typical of human nature, isn't it? You know, if I'd really wanted to do it, really wanted to play Ethel and insisted on it, I wouldn't have got it, you know? Well, exactly nine days after I'd signed the contract, The Private Lives of Ethel and Albert went out on national radio with that first script of mine, live from Studio 8E of the RCA building, on the 17th of April, 1944, at 4 p.m. <laughs> The small things in everyday life are familiar to every family in every household. And it's these trivial problems, rather than the major ones, that make up the private lives of Ethel and Albert. Mother sent me flowers after the broadcast. Even though she hadn't heard it, my show wasn't carried by her local station in Rochester. It was the first dozen roses I'd ever had. She also sent back my laundry, clean, mended, and pressed. Well, within a month of that first show, I was answering anywhere from 10 to 15 fan letters or cards every day and giving interviews, getting noticed, and getting notices. As one review put it, quote, Good writing, unusually accurate casting, and careful production give this five-a-week feature the pace and dramatic excitement usually associated with a high-cost evening program. The storyline is simple but effective. The day-to-day -day life of a young married couple living in a small American town. And Peg Lynch is the little lady who owns, writes, helps produce, and acts in this delightful comedy series. End quote. And I quite liked when a reporter for America Magazine's Interesting People column called me a one-woman tornado of the air. Miss Lynch, how do you manage to write so accurately about married life without being married yourself? How many detective story writers are murderers, I replied. But I think what pleased me most was getting a big mention in Mother's local paper in Minnesota, which was read by everyone she knew in town. The Rochester Post Bulletin says, quote, Our girl Peg is sailing on the crest of a wave along New York's high and turbulent seas. Mother bought 11 copies. Is my sudden fame going to your head? I wrote to her. In your last letter, you didn't scold me once. Not like you, toots. You'd have plenty to say if you could see the unhappy state of my dresser drawers. I had no time for anything, really, other than work. I was up early, write a script, 
race up to the RCA building, rehearse, do the show, go home, eat. If I ate beforehand, I'd upchuck from nerves, answer fan mail, personal mail, fall into bed, read a book, and then start all over again the next morning. But it was worth it. As one fan letter said, Miss Lynch, you have the most refreshing and funny daytime show in the air. My father will not leave for work until the last line has been spoken. That kind of thing was nice to hear. Now let me tell you about my co-star. Speaking of last lines. Richard Widmark did not like radio. He felt above it. Now he's from a little tiny town of about 400 in Minnesota. He's Swedish too. So again, the Swedes and the Norwegians clocked horns and he didn't like the show. He didn't want anything to do with radio. He wanted to be a movie star and he was hell bent to get to Hollywood, which is all very well, but he trampled on toes and he offended people. And he was very rude to me. He got up from the very first show we did. He left his hat on all through the whole thing. I thought that was this. I guess I'm being a little silly, but I mean, I think to leave your hat on when you go in a studio to do a show with only another person and a girl, he had the, could have had taken his hat off. He got up at the end of his speech. I had the last speech, last lines, which was, well, longer than just one sentence. And he got up at the end of his and walked right out of the studio without saying go out by or waving or anything like that, which I thought was really rude. And I never liked him after that. I thought, actually, I thought he didn't like me. Well, of course he didn't, I suppose. He didn't like anybody. And he was cold and distant to almost everyone. Never talked to the announcer or the sound effect man or nothing. I didn't like Richard Widmark. But I put up with him. I had a successful show. He was part of it. Hell, he was half of it. And I was making money. $200 $200 for writing each show, 125 for acting. I tell you, I felt like a millionaire after all my struggles. You never know how long you're going to last in this racket, I wrote Mother. But at the moment, everything's coming my way. I just hope I have the sense to work hard and keep it that way. And I did, despite Richard Widmark, who didn't become any easier or nicer to work with. And it's end of six months, he said to me on a Friday, um... I can I see you in the hall? And I said, sure, and went out the hall, and he said, I won't be back on Monday. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I'm going into a play, and I'm afraid you'll have to get somebody else. The network was furious. They told Widmark his contract stipulated he had to give them one week's notice, and they made him stick to it. So he did come back the following week, and we did do the shows, but he never looked at me once in five days, not once. Incidentally, the Broadway play he left me for was called Trio, which was about lesbians. And New York theater goers weren't quite ready for lesbians in 1944, and it closed not overnight, but just about, for which I was very glad. And Widmark went on to do, well, just what he wanted. He became a movie star. He did. There's a famous scene in Kiss of Death, which is Richard Widmark's first movie. He plays Tommy Udo, a smooth but uh, intermittently psychotic criminal. He's terrorizing an old woman in a wheelchair, and he pushes her to the top of the stairs. And we think, no, 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 he he wouldn't do that. And then he gives with this crazy, creepy laugh, and we think, yeah, he's going to do it. By the way, that's his laugh. Really, that maniacal cackle that he gave as he pushed her down the stairs. We auditioned for New Alberts all that week. I think we saw about 40, and I only liked one of them, and he nearly didn't make it. He was late. And he arrived just as we were packing up to leave. But I said, oh, well, look, he's here. He's come all this way. Let's read him anyway. And he read. And um... nobody else wanted him. He overdid it terribly. I can't remember what the show, what the script was. But he just overdid it. But you can always calm somebody down. But you cannot get it out of them if they're dragging. You know, if I knew I could tone him down. So anyhow, I liked him. And uh, I picked him. And nobody else wanted him. The network was keen on an actor who was well-known in the business named Stotts Cotsworth, who had auditioned about 20 minutes earlier. I was sitting making notes afterwards when the sound man sidled over for a quiet word in my ear. I think you should know, he said, what Stotts Cotsworth just said to me. He said all he had to do was ask Peg Lynch out to dinner, then take her home and screw her, and the role of Albert was his. 
I thanked the sound man, and I accepted Stotts Cotsworth's invitation to dinner, suggesting we go somewhere perhaps a little more special than the joint around the corner, hinting that I'd something rather important to tell him. And we ended up at 21, which was very swank. We had champagne. I ordered a lobster. The waiter asked if we'd like dessert, and Cotsworth said, oh, no, 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 we didn't care for it. I said, oh, but I did, and I ordered the crepe Suzette, you know, where they flame it at the table. And when I'd finished, I said, oh, by the way, you might be interested to know that we've chosen our new Albert. It's Alan Bunce. Thank you for dinner. And I got up and left. The moral, and we keep telling you this, don't mess with Peg Lynch, the one-woman tornado of the air. I signed Alan Bunce the next day for three years, and we would go on to work together as radio and then television, man and wife, for the next 20. The press release trumpeted the news thus, quote, Personable young Alan Bunce has taken over the role of Albert. Out of 40 men who auditioned for the part, Alan was chosen as the most desirable husband for Peg Lynch's Ethel. Bunce is a well-known figure on the airwaves. For the past six years, he's been starring in Young Dr. Malone and is flexible and a capable actor. I was very fond of him, and he did very well. He did, although it took him a while. He was so used to soap opera acting. The Private Lives of Ethel and Albert comes to you each weekday at this same time. The show was written by Peg Lynch, who plays the part of Ethel. Albert is played by Alan Bunce. The program is produced by Bob Cotton. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. And uh, we've got 800 and some, we'll say 829 letters, I got to say. I certainly like your show, I did like it, but I just can't stand your new Albert. He just doesn't sound right at all, and it just isn't good. He's terrible. And I thought, well, so I answered them all. And I said, just be patient. I said, it'll take a while. As it always says when you change something, and you're going to be surprised, you're going to like him. And I heard from absolutely everybody. I got a nice letter from absolutely every single one thanking me for my letter and saying I was right. Now they were used to him, and they thought he was very good. And except one four-page, single-space, typewritten letter, hate me, hate the show, hate everybody, and so forth, and they don't like him at all. I dumped that. Uh, so she found the one person in America who didn't like her or the show. But she's about to find the one guy. Actually, James, there were three. Mm, three? Well, this is the, the private life. But there was that one famous heartthrob from Hollywood you'll hear about next on The Private Life of Peg Lynch. The Private Life of Peg Lynch was written by Astrid King and produced by Alex King.